Welcome to the Brute Facts Podcast with your host and everybody's favorite Christian, Eddie Kroon. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell for future content. Welcome to Brute Facts. I have one of the biggest guests that I've ever had on here. Um, Dr. Graham Oppie. I am trying as hard as I can to not fanboy, uh, although I'm a theist and he isn't. He is one of my favorite philosophers, and I was absolutely humbled and stoked when I asked him to come on to the show, and he agreed uh, with no issue whatsoever. So let's bring Dr. Oppie on and find out a little bit about him. How are you doing, Dr. Oppie? Oh, very well. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I'm really appreciative that you come on to a show this small. Uh, one day I'll be big and famous, and you'll be glad that you did. So <laughs> uh, so how, how's it going there in uh, Melbourne? Is that where you're at? Yeah, so yes, um, it's a very nice day today. Um, so we're kind of just about to head into winter, but it's blue skies and sunshine. It'll be, oh, I don't have to do the conversion of the temperatures. It's about 16 yeah. degrees Celsius. So yeah, that's it's quite, that... quite pleasant. It seems like no uh, no matter how long I mess around with math or at what level, I can't ever get the Fahrenheit to Celsius right. It just it seems almost impossible to work out sometimes. Um, so you are, uh, for those that don't know, a PhD philosopher. You're a professor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I know you've written many of articles, uh, books. Um, on, I think your dissertation was philosophy of language. Um, yeah, that's right. So the, I, the topic there is a little bit esoteric, so maybe we can kind of skip over the details of exactly <laughs> what it was about. And PhDs are often like that. Yeah. Well, I, I just, uh, recently started getting into philosophy of language because, um, you know, so many times when we have debates and things and people we're just we're just arguing semantics you know it's like well th that's what we need to be talking about we need to know exactly what you mean by what you mean um so growing up did you what do you you consider yourself just agnostic or what what kind of position do you hold okay so i'm an atheist so i don't think that there are any gods so in particular i don't think that there's a single god um, and so that puts me at odds with most of the religious traditions around the world. Um, so, so that's how I would describe, I mean, I guess the way that I would describe myself would be to say that I'm a naturalist. So roughly, I think that the causal stuff is just exhausted by the universe or if there's kind of many universes that kind of space right. in which all, all, right. which all the universes fit but i'm going to it's much easier to, to kind of describe the view if we think well you know this is just our universe that's that's where all the causal stuff is right so did you grow up religious or um uh, yes so my background has quite a lot of religion in it um so i'm thinking about my parents my grandparents and so on so um, on both sides of the family, the tradition is Methodist. So it's, um, uh, I guess, UK Methodist. So my ancestors came from the UK to Australia and brought their Methodism with them. Uh, my, my grandmother on my father's side was very active in the Bible Society um, throughout her life she lived to be 90 and she was still an active member of the bible society when she was 90. at one point my father sort of con considered becoming a preacher uh, but he ended up deciding to go with engineering instead uh, <laughs> and uh, he he I, it's sort of interesting so my mother 
that so they met through church um my father went to sydney to do a masters and um happened to go to the same to start attending the same church that my mother was at um my mother's religious beliefs kind of stayed fixed right through her life so she was still a believer um when she died my father it was a bit less clear there were various things that happened in the last part of his life that um to me anyway i kind of suspect that he was more, much more agnostic by the time that he died but that's that's long after i'd become an atheist so right. so the next part of the story um so i grew up in a, a sort of pretty by australian methodist standards it was sort of conventionally religious household okay so, well yeah so, it, it, so, so i couldn't explain what that meant we went to church on sundays i went to sunday school before i went to church we said grace before meals we said prayers at night um it's not it's not huge it's not a kind of huge commitment the way it might be in some branches of the christian faith but it was you know reasonable um and that i did that until i was 12 or 13 uh, and then over a very short period of time, I just decided I didn't believe it. And uh, that was kind of the end of my connections with the church, really. I continued to go to church occasionally with my parents for special events. That lasted until I was like you know, 18 or something. And then I just stopped now. It's weddings, just, I'm done. weddings I'm and done. funerals. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm tired of messing with it. Well, at least it was uh, Methodist and... Uh, not something, you know, far more conservative and legalistic. And um, I'm not sure, you know, about Methodists in the UK, but here they're uh, pretty reasonable and, you know, not legalistic, literalist that, you know, you're going to hell and uh, you need to believe and all these things. So that's pretty, uh, that's, that's better than what it could have been. So did you, uh, so you, at a young age, you decided that um, you just, you didn't believe anymore. You Yeah, so it's kind of hard to remember <laughs> the kind of the detailed process. So I started, I sort of started wondering about, for, and I don't know why I started. And a few weeks later, I wasn't wondering anymore. I just stopped believing and it's not because i talk to people i was just i spent a lot of time thinking about it i've got no idea what the thought processes were but at the end of it i just you know i was just an atheist so yeah that's that's a point I, that's actually something i'd like to come back to um is your thoughts on beliefs um in general so did what what led you to want to do philosophy of religion um once you were you just still intrigued by the fact that so many people still believed or the so many stories and religions uh what was the motivation there um so i've told this story before it's kind of it was kind of accidental you mentioned that i did um, philosophy of language as my PhD and I didn't really study much philosophy of religion but I came back to Australia without a job and I went to and my wife had a, a job in Canberra so I went back to Canberra with her and then uh, the ANU needed the Australian National University needed someone to teach philosophy of religion and so and they asked me could I do it so I thought yep I can do that and so then I taught myself philosophy of religion while I was teaching it to the students, you know, just one week ahead of the class, that's enough, um, <laughs> all, 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 all the way through the semester. And um, and by the end of it, uh, I knew a bit about philosophy of religion, enough that I published a couple of papers, as you kind of do. Yeah. And then um, I, got a, I got a sort of contract job for a while and I was teaching other things, a bit of history of philosophy, a bit of logic. Um, and I had this opportunity to apply for a grant. Um, and so I thought, I'll apply for a grant to do some research on reformed epistemology. I didn't even really know what it was, but I thought, um, I'm not going to waste lots of time with this application. So I just wrote out the application and I got a three year postdoc out of it. And in order to fulfill the obligations of a postdoc, I actually had to write a book. So that was where the book on ontological arguments came from. And by the time I'd written that book, I was kind of 
settled down this path of doing philosophy of religion. So it wasn't really that I chose it. I just fell into it. Really. Yeah, that's that's kind of how philosophy of religion is. It kind of chooses you. It's its own kind of uh, its own kind of theistic thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my my background is uh, mechanical, and if you would have said, you know. 20 years ago that I'd be immersed in philosophy period, much less philosophy of religion. I would have been like that. So why, why would I get into something where people just think and then argue over thinking? And, but the more that I learned, the more I was intrigued and it just kind of here, you know, 15 years later, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a total lay person. Um, I've spent a lot of time and uh, it, 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 conversing with higher level philosophers and things of that nature. So um, by no means any kind of expert. So, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's all self-taught and it's just, you know, something that ended up becoming a passion for me. Um, right. As you go on, you find more reasons to keep doing what you're doing. So um, there are other stories that I could tell about the, the way that my career has gone on and why I've kept doing certain kinds of things. Uh, but that was a kind of origins story, how I got yeah. into it. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's, yeah, you just kind of fell into it. I, I don't, I'm not sure if you uh, uh, know Tom Jump or not, but I, I had Tom on and, and had interviewed him and, and I asked him about, you know, philosophy. Why do you, he said, philosophy is terrible. He said, I just got into it, uh, just arguing and got into it. And now it's just something to make money. And I was like, OK, well, I mean, I guess that's a good reason if there's any. But um, so I the uh, going you've done so many things in philosophy. Uh, I mean, you're kind of like the jack of all trades. Uh, and I didn't even know you had done anything with reformed epistemology. I was actually just talking with some guys in a group earlier about reformed epistemology because I started out uh, as a reformed epistemologist and since I've moved away from it. Um, did you do a whole lot of work on, on it or was it just something that? So, so what happened uh, was that I started by reading um, Planting as 1974 books. So The Nature of Necessity and God, Freedom and Evil and thought, I'll start by writing something about ontological arguments. And so I started researching ontological arguments a little bit. And I started writing some stuff and I realised after a while that I was going to have enough material for a book. And so that that's all that I got done, right? <laughs> my, my research in that project didn't get beyond researching ontological arguments. So, so I, didn't, I didn't really end up doing much research research at all on reformed epistemology. <laughs> I don't blame you. It's, you know, it's, I spent quite a while in it. And um, when, you know, when I would defend uh, reformed epistemology and uh, we would have these discussions and, you know, these Facebook groups and things and they're, uh, you know, and, and I'm kind of laying it out and I'm like, you do realize that, that this is something that was developed over many years many volumes. There's no way I can put all this out there, you know, for you to understand it, because on the surface, it seems, it, and then there are some issues with it, but uh, on the surface, it seems like there's easier, uh, worse problems than really what there is. So it, it was kind of just where I fell into. And uh, onto the ontological argument in ontology is actually what got me into philosophy uh, period. Um, I had heard R.C. Sproul, which I didn't know at the time was, you know, reformed and more or less a presuppositionalist. And, but he had talked about, and it was the first time I'd ever heard anything about, um, you know, an ontological argument. I couldn't wrap my head around what it was. And, and I was like, that's just, that's too easy. There's got to be something, you know, that's, <laughs> that's there. And, uh, uh, that's kind of where, of course, I don't think it's a convincing argument, but that's kind of what hooked me into it. So, Yeah, so so I got really interested in the ontological argument or in 
ontological arguments because one of the things I decided was that there's lots and lots of them and they all require different things to be said about them. And that was yeah. how it, that one that was how I ended up with the book. Um, yeah, it's it's remains an, a topic of interest to me. I don't think that I mean maybe this is just kind of characteristic of philosophy that the final word never gets said about anything. But there's still lots and lots of interesting stuff being written about ontological arguments. Yeah, that's uh, that's what surprised me. I had, uh, of course, you've been on uh, Joe's show quite a bit, um, and when he came on, he wanted to talk about um, and the ontological argument or an ontological argument, and I I see exactly why now. Uh, I spends a lot of time with you, so <laughs> it's just it's a, to me it's an interesting subject. I mean, just ontology, you know, in general. Uh, I love metaphysics. I love, you know, uh, ontology. It's the things that it, the, the hardest to wrap your head around seem to be the kind of things that draw certain people in. And I'm one of those people. Um, so are you doing any work now on it or are you still just uh, is it just kind of a few papers here and there or talking about it here and there? Or? Um, so I haven't I haven't done any new work on it for a while. I've been busy thinking about other things. I mean, I sometimes wonder whether I should go back and kind of do a sort of revised version of the book on ontological arguments and kind of update it because it was written in the early 90s and there's a lot that's happened in, yeah. in the discussion of the arguments since then. But I don't know. That makes it. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things you'll get drawn into. Maybe there'll be a grant there somewhere for you or <laughs> a task or something that you can uh, fulfill there. Um, so not to totally just flip upside down, but uh, I had mentioned earlier um, about when we were talking about beliefs and this and the other. So what is your, how, what is your um, philosophical position on uh belief forming do you have it you know any particular type of epistemology um for how we come to have the beliefs that we have or justified or okay so i guess i'm broadly sympathetic to the kind of picture that um, Thomas Reed had, there are various sources that are kind of legitimate sources for our beliefs. So obviously perception and introspection are two of them. Uh, but in, in, and perhaps you might think of the other things as being slightly derivative from those, but testimony, which, right, <laughs> hearing what people say uh, is one of the biggest sources of beliefs and um, we tend to believe what people tell us I mean of course that's a very broad rule of thumb we're actually quite careful in figuring out who we can trust um, who, who are the reliable sources of information but when we've got those people and they're talking about things that we think they know a lot about we tend to just believe what they say so um, so testimony is very important um, memory and then there's also inference on once you've got some beliefs, you can infer other beliefs from them. So there's, there's a diversity of sources for belief that um, any sensible person is going to make use of. Uh, it's very hard for it. Just, just think about how hard it would be to have to kind of be, to have a sort of satisfactory set of beliefs if you never relied on what anyone else told you and you insisted on working everything out for yourself. You would know next to nothing about anything if that was your approach. Yeah, you would be uh, Descartes all over again, trying <laughs> <laughs> trying to put things back together. So, <laughs> well, except that I'm thinking here, you're trying to assemble them for the first time. So, oh yeah, you're but, right. And, and yeah. then, I mean, if you think about how long it's taken us to get to where we are with maths and physics and chemistry and things like that, if you had to do it on your own, you wouldn't get anywhere. You just, right. You just, yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Um, you know, when uh, I get questioned about, uh, you know, the testimony, you know, being a Christian, um, it, it, you seem to get camps that uh, you have, you know, a lot of theists that will accept 
just about any testimony. And then you have uh, the other side who thinks that testimony is absolutely worthless. And it's like, you do realize that pretty much everything we believe, you know, and that has a scientific and cons uh, academic consensus or something like that is because of testimony. You know, these people have credentials and we tend to trust them. Uh, so, yeah, I totally agree um, with the, uh, with that idea, do you think that, so I kind of take the stance that when I get asked, you know, do we choose our beliefs or is it totally a, uh, internal deterministic kind of thing? Um, intuitively to me, uh, beliefs can be something we choose some and some, we just kind of find ourselves with the belief. So I think you, you, I mean, it's sort of difficult if you think about something that you don't believe and say, okay, let me believe it. It kind of doesn't work. You can't choose your beliefs like that. But there's all kinds of ways that you can shape your beliefs. So you might think, oh, gee, I wish I had a lot of beliefs about quantum mechanics. So you can go away and study it, and that way you'll acquire the beliefs. Right? So, yeah. so um, things like what you pay attention to and what, what you decide to sort of invest effort in makes a difference to what you end up believing. Uh, and in that way, um, kind of the will enters into believing in a, a significant way. Yeah, yeah, I would, I'd totally agree with that. Um, so I didn't want to spend too much time on that. I was just kind of wondering what, you know, how, how you, your position on it was. So um, I do have to say, one of the all-star moments in any debate or discussion that I have seen was uh, with you and Loke. And L Loke laid out, well, I think, what, 16 premises for his argument. <laughs> and I think it was two pages, three pages long. And in the most gentleman way possible, uh it was more or less the way that you responded was, um, you know, well, you're going to have to have, you know, you got to support. I'm going to deny premise. You're going to uh, have to support that premise with another argument. Or I'm going to deny that. And then it it was like just in the most gentleman way possible is like, hey, let's cut the BS. Where is the issue? Let's talk about that. And it was like one of the one of my favorite moments that I've seen because even being, you know, uh, a lay philosopher and loving philosophy, I like things to be hashed out. But when you have beat a dead horse, so nice and see where we disagree. Uh, so it was definitely one of my favorite parts. So I guess that has to do with my attitude here. Like, I think we kind of you kind of know if you've got a theist and an atheist talking to each other, they're going to disagree about lots of things. But what they really need to do is to kind of um, come to understand the other person's point of view by finding out what they believe and how they think the various things hang together. So what are the kind of more fundamental things that they believe that support everything else? Before you turn to trying to make the other person change their mind and agree with you, that's sort of way down the list of right. <laughs> on, on the to-do list, things that you want to do. And in fact, you might well be, um, as I tend to be, not really that interested in, in trying to encourage people to change their views right i think you know, there, there's kind of a prior there's this prior stuff about understanding that's much more important I yeah absolutely I, I agree totally and that's you know a lot of times because i'm in philosophy of religion or and i'm a theist a lot of times you know um people will bring up apologetics or say apologist or something like that and i make it extremely clear i'm not an apologist you know apologetics is it's theological i'm not here to uh defend the faith or change people you know i, I don't do the evangelism that a lot of people do uh, i like to talk about what i believe why i believe it in the setting uh with other people who either do or don't believe like me and let's because i don't want to hold to irrational positions or non-logical positions and i think like just like you said a lot of people go into those and their whole um motivation is to win a debate win an argument or ch try to change somebody's mind 
And I think there's far more value if we can uh, say, okay, I truly believe this. And I think that this is a uh, very good, solid, sound argument. And the, and this is why. And then the other person's, you know, tells them, well, this, these are the issues that I see. So that's why I love the discussions instead of the debates. Um, and when people don't try to convert other people or deconvert, uh, it's definitely far more beneficial. Yeah, I'm a big fan of discussion and yeah. not, not, not much for one for debate. I mean, once, I mean, to go back to your initial example, if someone starts out with an argument that's got 16 premises, it's going to be very hard to have a discussion about that unless you just go, okay, so let's start at the top. Let's take the first thing and let's talk about that for perhaps right. a very long time. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I like Andrew, um, and w when he started talking about his the, his own version, uh, I grabbed my pen and pad because uh, I'm real ADD, so if I don't write stuff down, uh, it's hard for me to remember. So I grabbed my pen and pad, and I was like, okay, let's see what he's got, and he just kept going and going, and I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm not going to sit here. I just, I couldn't believe the, you know, how much of an argue, uh, how much it was that he brought. But uh, so, I mean, to be fair, there's a book that he's written and, you know, you can go and look in the book and you can yeah. sit down and, and, and you can sort of make an overview of the entire argument. Um, but it's kind of, it's difficult to bring that to a, to a chat. Yes. Yes, absolutely. But I thought it still um, it was still a pretty good informative uh, discussion. Um, it you know it was a little, little accent language barrier kind of hard for me to follow sometimes and excitability on his side. But uh, uh, I'm definitely more for the discussions and the whole book thing. Uh, I have a problem with the books. And that is, uh, I can't stop buying books <laughs> when I don't finish books. Um, I have the, I go buy other ones and then leave them half finished or something. So I have this whole stack of books that I've read like parts of or skimmed or yeah. chapters or so. That's okay. That will be true of every professional philosopher, right? Yeah. And, and sometimes that will be kind of deliberate because you look up the index and you find the bit that you're interested in. But it's also the case. You start reading books and they're very big and after a while you think, I'm not getting much out of this. I'm just going to give up. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you said that because I, I was thinking it's like because there's another one. Somebody else writes a book and I'm like, oh, gosh, I got to get that. That's going to be great. You know, and then I have this wish list on Amazon. <laughs> it's like this long and. Other people are like, hey, why don't you, have you checked out my book? And then I feel compelled to have to get their book. And I have this whole list of books already. So uh, it's definitely not something I ever anticipated for sure. So I've, I, you can't see it because it's over, over there. But that side of the room is just lined with books. Um, there's, I don't know, there's a thousand books or something sitting there. I haven't read half of them because life's too short. I just... You just can't. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I keep it just like you. I keep acquiring them, and then there's, right. more, there's more behind me as well. So. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's almost like an obsession or something. It's, it's you know, as long as I have the book, I know I can go to it later yeah. or look at the chapter or something like that when I want it. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely. My wife for a while was like, "You got another book? You, you got another book?" Um, you know, and some, uh, and of course, you know, I mean, some of the books are expensive, uh, but you feel like you need it at the time when you're going through a certain subject. So do you have a, um, so what would be your, um, favorite argument or what do you think is the, the most strong, the strongest argument against theism? Would you take maybe the, I've heard you uh, talk about uh, the problem of evil time to time, or uh, would you say that was probably the... So so I think that really the strongest kind of argument is almost certainly going to be some kind of cumulative argument where you put together a whole lot of different 
considerations and argue that collectively they support your view over some competing view. So to take a first example, I think that um, Swinburne's book, The Existence of God, where he sets out this Bayesian argument, um, so he starts off with sort of prior probability and then he considers, I don't know, about a dozen different bits of evidence that he thinks provide strong support for the existence of God. That argument is going to be stronger than any argument that just considers one of the bits of evidence and tries to make the case. And so on the other side, um, I'll give a little plug for one of my books, the, the book, The Best Argument Against God. I do the same kind of thing, except not in the Bayesian framework. I say, you know, there's these two, uh, there's these, we'll, we'll, we'll compare um, theism and naturalism. Um, there's a kind of question about which one's simpler. And then there's all this evidence, lots and lots of stuff. Why is there something rather than nothing, fine tuning, evil, lots and lots of stuff. And then just weigh the two views up. What yeah. I think happens if you do that is, that you're not going to get a persuasive argument, but you will help people to understand why you believe as you do, because they can see what you think about all the different bits of evidence that seem to be relevant and why you think that your view is at least competitive on all the bits of evidence. And I don't think that you're going to get a stronger argument than that kind of argument. Yeah, I, w I would totally agree. And that's actually one of the points that, um, you know, I make a lot when people ask me, you know, why are you a theist or why are you a Christian? Um, you know, if I wasn't a Christian, I would still probably be a deist or something like that. Because to me, um, when you take the set of cosmological arguments, uh, you know, in an abductive reasoning, it, it just seems to build a case that there's some necessary foundation to you know reality and and uh you know of course we can you know you go on into a god a personal god and things like that but i just find them convincing and it's funny because lately it seems like everybody's talking about the kalam and you know my understanding is the kalam was not even meant or intended to get to God. It was basically like part of the abductive process for having a first cause. Um, and so I, I just, I don't think it, when we take these arguments in uh, isolation, they really, it, none of them are powerful uh, alone. I think you have to look at it from an abductive nature. Right. So unless you have the view that there's a kind of knockdown proof, that takes you all the way to God. So you can kind of prove not only that God exists, but God's got all of the, you know, this long list of attributes. I don't think there's going to be any alternative to what you just said, right? The kind of overall support for the view is just going to be abductive. And then we can, and then we can say, okay, so you think this is the best explanation for all of this stuff, but is it? What about these alternative views? And so, you know, the deists, will, the deists will be at the table. Lots of other people will be too. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, um, you know, with with some of the new atheists that, that I come across, they, you know, want to focus on all of these things that really don't matter. And, and I, I try to tell them, I'm like, look, if you um, really want some good arguments against God, then you need to focus on, you know, like a set of arguments like divine hiddenness, the problem of evil and suffering, or animal suffering, you know, th because when you take all these other, you take all of those arguments and you put them together, they seem to kind of paint a uh, grim picture, you know, <laughs> at least for there being an all good God or, you know, the omni God. So, um, yeah, so those kinds of considerations might not count against the kind of indifferent deistic god yeah. one who set the ball rolling and then went on holidays for example yeah <laughs> yeah he, he hooked it all up and bounced out he said okay yeah. see y'all later that's <laughs> so um the uh on what would you say um given if you were to consider theism again 
what would be the the most convincing idea of theism to you? Uh, would it be like a deistic kind of uh, intelligent something other? Or? Yeah, so it's kind of it's hard to say, but that would I guess that seems closest to where I am, right? If you if you because it builds the least into the 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 theistic theory. Uh, and given that I'm not a theist, but maybe if I went there, I'd found it kind of find it kind of unsatisfactory, and I like you know, I'd want to keep going further. I mean, that's really hard to say because it it's not it, it it's not a kind of life possibility for me. I don't think that I'm going to do that. But um, yeah, yeah. It's... So so it's kind of so it is really kind of hard to speculate. Yeah, it's yeah, it's uh, you don't believe, but if you did believe, what would you believe? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's kind uh, of tricky. Yeah, most definitely, or maybe some type of ontological something that we can uh, kind of define into existence, or because I don't know how many times I've heard you know the ontological arguments defining God into existence and. Uh, I just, I'm like, eh, I don't think that's the best uh, objection. But uh, no, I wouldn't say so either. I wouldn't say that that was the best objection. So, who would be? Um, do you have any philosophers that would be uh, like your biggest had the I had a huge influence on you? Or are you? a classical philosopher kind of person with the uh, ancient philosophers or there maybe modern ones? So, okay. So the biggest philosophical influences on me would have been my teachers. So, um, so I was an undergraduate at Melbourne Uni and somebody that no one listening to this podcast will have heard of probably, a guy called Alan Hazen was the, by far the biggest influence on me when I was an undergraduate because he he was quite happy for me to come and talk to him about stuff outside, outside of class. I spent lots of time talking to him and I learned kind of metaphysics and motor logic and stuff from him. Um, so he would, in some ways, I, if you had to pick one person, he would probably have been the single biggest influence. When I went to graduate school, my advisor, Gil Harmon, and another guy who was on my panel, David Lewis, were both enormous um, influences on me. And you can see the effects of their their views and dis- sort of discussions with them in in my work. Historically, um, I have not not haven't ever really been a, a serious student of ancient philosophy. So you know, as an undergraduate, I read some Platonic dialogues and I occasionally read bits of Aristotle. Um, and so on, but I, I don't have the languages, and I don't, um, and I've never really seriously studied it. So I wouldn't say that there are kind of influences there. Amongst the moderns, uh, I mean, in some ways, it's a bit the same story. Like I've read bits and pieces. Uh, I've read a fair bit of Hume, and I really kind of I think Hume's a very interesting character, but. Um, there are kind of aspects of his philosophy that I just couldn't possibly accept. So, yeah. uh, right, and 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 that's kind of true for the historical figures in general, right? There'll be bits and pieces in them that I like, and then there'll be other stuff in there that I don't. And partly, it's just I think that has to do with their circumstances just being so different from the ones in which we live. Um, there are other people who sort of a much fonder of the history of philosophy as a kind of source for their own current views than I am. Well, you know, this, this whole time we've been talking, you have constantly been making me feel better and better because I'm kind of the same way. I, I try, you know, I, I've, I've read, you know, a bit of it about Aristotle and Plato and the ancient philosophers, and it's mostly the, the newer philosophers or people directly related to, you know, where I've been learning that's the biggest influence. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of feels almost like a sin that if you're not like this uh, super 
uh, ancient philosopher buff, you know, or or you have to love them or, you know, uh, something like that. So it's, I mean, <laughs> there's just too much f- philosophy for anybody to kind of, to be able to be across all of it. And there are some people who are super impressive who know a great deal about ancient, medieval and modern philosophy. That is, say, moderns, I mean, up until, say, some point in the 19th century. Uh, But if you're going to be expert about all that stuff, there's going to be lots of stuff about the last 150 years that you're going to know next to nothing about because nobody can can be across everything. There just has to be specialization well you know and that's uh, that's one of the things that i found kind of just stumbling into philosophy is it's extremely overwhelming because there's literally i mean you can take you know one one area of epistemology and a philosopher will spend his entire academic career working on it and then you have all these other things, a philosophy of mind, philosophy of language. And it's it's so and, and you want to try to get all of it in. You want to learn, you know, because you talk to this guy who's really smart in this area in philosophy. And you're like, man, I need to learn more about that. And then here and then here. And so I explained it to uh, my wife. I said, uh, because she was totally like blindsided years ago about just like I was, how I got into philosophy. But one of the uh, the analogies I use is I tell I said, if you take like the safety glass that they put in vehicles now and you crack it, it comes up with all these millions of cracks or thousands of cracks. You pick one crack and that's where a philosopher will spend his entire academic career. And you have all these other cracks still out there. So you can't possibly get to uh, all of them as much as we want to. And it's worse than that, really, because um, to do many areas of philosophy, you need to know about other disciplines as well. Like if you want to do philosophy of physics, you better know some physics. Right? <laughs> and if you want to do philosophy of history, you better know some history and so on. For philosophy of maths, you really better know quite a bit of maths and so on. And so it's not just trying to get across the philosophy. You also have to get across a bunch of other areas. And this is true in philosophy of religion as much as anywhere else. You need to know, um, depending what your area of focus is, you need to know some stuff about history. You need to know some stuff about ethics and politics. You need to know some stuff about theology. Um, in fact, what, I mean, this is really one of the things I like about philosophy of religion. Um, it turns out that metaphysics, epistemology, philosophy of mind, logic, they're all relevant. So you have to know right. You have to know a bit about a whole lot of things in order to do it. Right, absolutely. And that, that was something, of course, I, I never foresaw, you know. And, um, you know, and the thing is, it, it also seems like that when you talk to, you know, uh, higher level philosophers or those that have been in it a lot longer than I have, this they seem to have a label and a category for each area that they follow like you know a specific epistemology and a specific grounding you know specific ontology and i'm just like I- i'm still trying to work that out i don't know you know exactly uh where i'd be on you know, like philosophy of mind i'm i'm totally lost right now i i consider myself a substance dualist at one time and now i'm just like uh, i don't know uh, maybe um oh hylomorphism i I don't know where I'm at now. So, so, so if you go to the um, the Phil Papers, um, uh, Phil People, whatever it's called, the Chalmers, yeah, Phil, yeah, where, where they've got the survey results for the big list of questions. Uh, so I've done that survey, and for about two thirds of the questions, I just put no opinion. Right. It's, it's not like it's not like you have to have an opinion about all of those things in order to be a philosopher. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I've actually heard people uh, uh, in certain online debates uh, appeal to surveys like that as evidence for things. And I'm like, 
I don't think I'd be, you know, putting too much stock in questionnaires and philosophy. You know, it just, uh, it just, it, it's not something that's that that's going to be, you know, like some type of academic consensus or not. The the data there might be interesting though. So, yeah. um, according to the Phil Papers study, something like seventy five percent of people who work in philosophy of religion are theists, but about seventy five percent of philosophers are atheists. So, I and mean, that's kind of interesting and maybe says something about what the field of philosophy of religion is like these days. It doesn't tell you anything about where the truth lies, though. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to be making any appeals to authority or, you know, it's a academic consensus or something like that. And that's what's funny about philosophy is, and I've actually heard people in online debates use a consensus in philosophy for certain things. And I'm like, well, whoa, 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 that's not like a scientific consensus or something. That's a, it's a, so like it, I've heard people use the stat that most philosophers are, uh, atheist, you know, therefore atheism is, you know, more likely or something like that. It was crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are experts that you can treat a little bit like gurus in physics or maths or things like that, right? Someone's a member of one of the academies. You want to know the answer to a question. If you've got access to them, you can ask them and they'll tell you what the answer is. You can't treat philosophers like that. There are no yes. philosophers who are gurus who just you right. know, are reliable sources of you know, the truth about metaphysics and epistemology and logic. And, well, logic's slightly different, but metaphysics, epistemology, yeah. ethics and so on. Yeah, I, I, love, I love logic. I love formal logic. It's, uh, I'm an analytical kind of guy, not just, I mean, analytic philosophy, but just analytically, period. I'm a structured kind of person. Uh, so when I discovered, uh, you know, logic and formal logic and symbolic logic, uh, it was just right up my alley. I was like, look, we can take we, we can take arguments and put it in a math equation. How cool is that? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> but I'm not a huge fan of math either. Uh, I must say, though, the conversation you had with Craig on um, the argument for God with using mathematics was very interesting and intriguing and. I thoroughly enjoyed that uh, exchange. Yeah, so I enjoyed that one too. So um, I've had, I, I, living in Australia, I don't get as many chances as I would like to have to talk to people like Bill. But I, I met him first years ago at a conference, a cosmology conference in Santa Barbara back in the 90s. And so I've, I've had a few chances to chat to him. He's a he's a really good philosopher. Yeah, I heard he was um, a, a very pleasant person to uh, talk with, and um, kind of like you, he's willing to go on these smaller shows and uh, <laughs> uh, you know and, and talk with people uh, on them. And uh, that's to me that says a lot about uh, your character and his character. Um, so I told you I would only keep you for an hour. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience, if you don't mind taking a few questions. Sure, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Pasta, you want to take over the uh, question and answer section, or are you going to put them up for me to read? There you go. I guess I put them up. How many philosophy degrees does it take to provide evidence for Jesus actually being his own? Okay. Yeah. That's not even really a good question. <laughs> How do you respond to Craig's second stage of the Kalam? So by that, I assume you mean the part of the argument that gets you from the universe has a cause to the cause of the universe is God. Um, I assume that's what the question's yeah. about. Uh, so in general, there's lots and lots of attention in cosmological arguments that's paid to the first stage, the stage of arguing that there's a cause of the universe, there's a first cause, there's a necessary being or whatever. And much less attention paid 
to the okay so granting that um how do we establish that that's the god of say the god of the gospels right uh, yeah. and it tends to be the case that the arguments for the second stage are not nearly as well worked out or as strong as the arguments for the first stage so i mean that's that's not to kind of respond in detail because to do that in detail response we need to know exactly what the claims are and what the yeah. further assumptions that are going to be made are but in general i think there's way more work left to do way more interesting work left to do on arguments that we've already got that um when it comes to the second stage as opposed to the first yeah so that would um the second stage would be that that's when or, where craig tries to go with a timeless spaceless immaterial cause is yeah. that uh, yeah so it, that's that gets into you know empirical uh you know data so given modern physics and uh, my understanding of how popular you know a eternal universe model is becoming and given the b theory of time and things of that nature it seems like it's a uh, tall mountain to have to climb so so there are definitely hard questions um to ask about the kind of timeless eternity and then god switches on time and is in time thereafter uh, there are definitely hard questions to ask about that and as you say you might bring in various kinds of considerations of that from physics about what physicists have to say about the nature of time that you might take to be relevant in that discussion right so uh oh I, I should know he would pop up a good one as an identity theorist how do you cash out qualia sense experience do you think our quality a qualitative language is deceiving how can we reduce or identify qualities with the purely quantitative so um I don't think that you should think of the physical universe as being purely quantitative. So I don't think that there's a kind of reduction of qualities to quantities here. It's just that the physical universe has various kinds of um, physical properties or qualities, whatever you want to. I mean, may, maybe I'll use the word properties and we'll save qualities for the properties of experience or something like that. Um, so i think that the right way to think about um, experiences is to think of them as some kinds of brain processes so this is a kind of a very old australian view defended by jack smart back in the early 60s and i think that jack was onto something uh, exactly so in that case the identification is straightforward if you want to know what what it's like to see a red patch assuming that you're functioning properly all you have to do is go and stand in front of one and look at it and then there'll be this processing that happens in you and that processing just is you're seeing the red patch you're experiencing of the red patch or whatever it doesn't seem to me that there's anything particularly problematic about this view but of course that's highly controversial there are there are lots of people who have differing views yeah this this one uh is above my pay grade so i'll let your answer stand <laughs> uh, oh so besides the advantage of naturalism is there other sustaining reasons for dr grand's atheism what does he think about the best version of evidential arguments from evil and divine hiddenness? I think so, so I, I think that um, the, the kind of overarching reason is that for, from my point of view, for favoring naturalism is that naturalism does the best job of kind of balancing out trying to minimize your commitments maximize your explanation i actually think that naturalism is sort of the kind of rock bottom simplest view so half of the argument sort of easy to make 
right? There's no, I mean, you can, you can not believe in things that naturalists believe in if you want, like try not believing that there's a moon, for example, and reduce your commitments. But there's stuff that's going to be very hard to explain if you think that there isn't a moon, stuff about our experience, right? Um, so I think that that's, that's sufficient. I don't think that if we're thinking about um, a theistic view, that you need some other reason to reject it. It seems to me that, you know, it, to reject to reject it in order to be able to accept naturalism. It seems to me that that's a kind of sufficient justification for naturalism all on its own. I don't think that there are versions of evidential arguments from evil or arguments from divine hiddenness to which theists simply have no reply so that their view just gets knocked down. It may be that sometimes when they're giving their replies, they've got to appeal to some new ontology or, some, you know, they've got to or appeal to some new principles or something like that, which makes their view a little bit more complicated than it otherwise would be. But that's not a decisive strike against the view because what matters is the kind of overall thing. Once we take everything into account, which is the better view? Um, and as far as I can see, in order to make a judgment coming down on one side or the other in that. You don't have to think that independently there's knockdown objections to the other view. You can just rest content with the, okay, so on the balance, it seems to me that my view is better though, you know, I can see that other people might disagree with me. Okay, yeah, definitely. So on that, I have one last question and it's kind of a follow-up and that is, what do you mean by natural? So, um, in one way, I, I think that actually people are not really in much doubt about what's meant by natural here, uh, especially theists. So think about um, the kind of theistic picture, so say Christian theists. So God makes a universe, a natural universe that operates according to natural laws. Of course, if you're a Christian, you may think that sometimes God... Uh, causes or allows things to happen that aren't in accordance with the laws. But suppose we remove that from the picture. What's left is just a natural universe operating according to natural laws. It's a very intuitive idea and theists all understand what it means. That's just what I mean by natural. Everything there is without God. <laughs> well, without God and, without God and right. the kind of specific things right. like miracles and angels and stuff like that. But, yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, and there's a, di there's a kind of different way of trying to work towards that, which, be, which would be to say, just point to all the stuff around you and say, well, this is all part of the natural universe, right? Um, right. And what I think is that all there is is stuff like this, and that's what the natural stuff is. Um, but um, neither of those is meant to be a definition. They're just meant to show that you kind of, everybody understands what we mean. And definitions are almost impossible to give in philosophy. There's hardly anything that you can <sighs> define. If you look at the history of attempts to define knowledge in the last 50 years, it's, it's all over the place and it doesn't arrive at any kind of agreement. I don't see why natural should be any different, right? Why it would be a problem if, as I suppose, it's actually kind of hard to define natural. Right. right. It's no, it's not like it's harder than it is to define knowledge, given the amount of effort that's gone into trying to define knowledge unsuccessfully so far. Yeah, that's just one of those little cracks in the windshield we were talking about. So yeah. it's right. yeah, when some somebody asks me, well, how do you know that, or or how do you justify that? I'm like. Do you, you do you know what you just asked me? It's you know because it's it's like it depends on what what theory of justification or knowledge that uh, one of the first books I read in philosophy was a um, undergrad book on the theory of knowledge, and it was so enlightening and eye opening to realize that everybody thinks that we have like, we just know stuff, you know, and you, you, you and if you ask them, well, how do you know that? Well, I just know it, you know? And then when you really start thinking about it, you're just like, Hmm, how do I know that? Do I really know that? So uh, it is definitely intriguing to say the least. 
So did you want to respond to that? Otherwise, I'm going to let you get back to your studies. <laughs> um, yeah, so no, I don't think I've really got anything to add on that question. I mean, it just, I mean, maybe I could add that it's not just knowledge. It's practically every interest in philosophical yeah. term is like this, that uh, often before people come to philosophy, they think if you're going to sort of speak philosophically, you've got to define all your terms first. Uh, but that's actually not the case. And sometimes where a word, the use of a word's contested, you might make a stipulative definition. You might say, for these purposes, this is what I mean. So that can happen quite a lot in philosophy of religion with God because the word God can be interpreted quite differently in different um, Absolutely. Parts, parts of the Christian tradition. And you might want to be talking about some particular conception in particular. But and so, but you, you when you're doing that, you're not defining the word. You're just stipulating what it's going to mean for certain purposes. Right, right. And, and that's actually something that I've seen um, when it, it's almost rare unless it's a formal debate and it's, you know, professional philosophers that people actually define the terms that they mean for their arguments. And what's worse than that is when they do that and then the uh, opposition brings their own definitions and it's like, wait a minute, if you're going to attack the argument they're laying out, you have to work within the framework of the argument and the definitions that they're using. You can't just come in with your own definition and try to undercut, uh, you know, the argument. So that, that's true. I mean, what you should do is uh, work with the definition, but say, and I think there's anything that satisfies that definition or something like that. I mean, that would be right. That would be fun. Yeah. Steel man. Always steel man your opponent. That's the best way to do it. Now I agree with that. Dr. Oppie, I am so humbled and gracious that uh, you have given us your time. Uh, come on here and talk with us and let us learn a little bit more about you. Um, uh, I do look forward to possibly in the future, maybe uh, if time permits, I know you have a very busy schedule, but uh, maybe actually talking about, you know, a specific philosophical area or something like that. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. And I wish you the best in your work and continue making great content. <laughs> so thank you for inviting me on. It's, I've, I've enjoyed it a lot. It's been great. All right. Thank you. And I'm going to see everybody out of here while you hop to the back. <laughs> well, there you go. Dr. Graham Oppie. Uh, don't know why he agreed to come on and talk with us, but he did. And I'm happy for it. So um, he's a brilliant philosoph philosopher. Uh, I have learned a lot from him, uh, even as a theist. He's very uh, humble in his approach has a lot of uh, intellectual humility and absolutely a gentleman. I think he sets a fantastic standard, not just for any atheist philosophers, but all philosophers. Uh, so hopefully we can uh, get a lot more people that will interact uh, like he does. And we can all be more oppiesque. But thank you, everybody, for joining us. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button, and we will be back uh, next week, I believe, with Dr. Tim Stratton. And we will be talking about uh, Molinism. So that'll be a fantastic show for sure. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a good evening. Be safe.